Good morning. Who's excited to be here today? Might as well be, right? <laughs> Good stuff. Hey, if you've walked around a little bit, you've noticed we are sort of under construction. we got new carpet coming Monday. Hopefully it'll be in by this time next week. So uh, please pardon our construction, but we're excited to be getting new stuff. And then it's also crazy t-shirt day, so I saw some crazy t-shirts for the children's today, and uh, this is my crazy t-shirt. It, it thinks it's a t-shirt. Don't tell anybody. It's real crazy. <laughs> You're right, Ian. It didn't go over well. <laughs> I was telling the joke earlier, like, I don't think they'll get it. Yeah, I should have went with my uh, test test there. So anyway. We're so happy you're here. We are in the book of Galatians, so if you have your Bible or your Bible app, you can turn there, click there, whatever it is. That's what the Bible app looks like, the Holy Bible app. Um, We're in a series. We're going through the whole book, and we've made it through chapters 1 and 2. We're now in chapter 3, going to go verses 1 through 14. And the sermon series title is The Truth of the Gospel, Galatians, The Truth of the gospel and the gospel is good news that's literally what the word means good news Jesus died rose for our sins if we repent and confess and believe and become more like Jesus we're free from the punishment of sin and death really good news right tough crowd jeez did y'all have your Wheaties this morning? <laughs> it's all right. I got more. Stay tuned. <laughs> so anyway, this is a letter, Galatians, written by the Apostle Paul to a church he founded in Galatia. Uh, and they'd slipped from true Christianity. What is true Christianity? It's spiritually driven faith. Spiritually driven faith. They'd slip from that and back to Jewish legalism, which is self-driven rules. In a nutshell. Rules are outward actions. Do this, do that. But not inward change. And God wants inward change. And that requires a relationship with God, which requires the Holy Spirit. The indwelling of the Holy Spirit requires it. When you're truly walking in step with the Holy Spirit and working on inward change, kind of funny, outward actions follow. Outward actions follow. So, first two chapters of uh, Galatians, Paul reminds the church of his authority because they're not only slipping back into this Jewish legalism, but they're also listening to these Judaizers who are saying, hey, why are you listening to Paul? Who's he? He wasn't one of Jesus' disciples. Paul goes on to, he gives them a smackdown, basically saying, you know, I preached the same gospel for 15 years. Uh, The disciples themselves have approved it on more than one occasion. Um, Stay in your lane, basically. (laughs) So, and last, uh, he even had to correct Peter for uh, hypocritical behavior, just uh, just like the Galatians were doing. So, last week he closed with this thought, and this was a key thought that kind of leads into today. And Paul says this many different times, many different ways. I no longer live, Christ lives in me. If you take one thing out of today, ingrain that on your brain. I no longer live, but it's Christ who lives in me. That is the goal. So now here we are starting chapter 3 and Paul gets to the core. He gets personal. He gets direct. He's been establishing his authority, telling the Galatians their their error, and now 
He's speaking directly to them, and I believe directly to us today. And he breaks it down. You know, he's been talking about false doctrine and Judaizers and circumcision and all this stuff, and he breaks it down to two things. Flesh and spirit. Flesh and spirit. So I want you to concentrate on that as we work through here today. Flesh and spirit. Chapter 3, verse 1. You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? After beginning by means of the Spirit, are you now trying to finish by means of the flesh? Have you experienced so much in vain if it really was in vain? Wow. Paul sounds agitated, doesn't he? Like, you imagine me getting up here on a Sunday? You idiots! What in the world's wrong with you? I think he had an issue with the way they were acting. And rightfully so. He calls them foolish and bewitched. And you look up the Greek word for bewitched. It's not, this isn't just throwing out words. This Greek meaning is associated with a spell being cast. We're talking about flesh versus spirit. We're talking about good versus evil. How can you go backwards? How can you go backwards? Did you receive the Spirit by works or by faith? Now, he's obviously asking this question in jest. He received the Spirit by faith. Sometimes, I think the better question today in churches is, let's cut that question down. Did you receive the Spirit? Did you receive the Spirit? Ask yourself, is the Holy Spirit dwelling in me? And while you ponder that, we'll move on. We'll try to answer that. That's an important question, don't you think? Is the Holy Spirit dwelling in me? You see, in the battle of flesh versus spirit... You can't have both. And we try. Man, do we try. I called myself a professional fence rider for years, riding that fence, towing that line between righteousness and doing what I wanted to do, between spirituality and flesh. That's where it's at. This is a common theme for Paul, flesh versus spirit. And when we get to Galatians 5, he expands it, so I'm not going to go too deep into it. But if this is something that, if you're asking yourself that question, and it's bouncing around in your brain, do, am I really indwelled with the Holy Spirit? That's a good thing. That's a good thing. Whether the answer is yes or no, it's a good thing. Especially if it's no. If you're struggling with that question, I urge you to write this down. Romans 8, 1 through 17. And read it on your time. Romans 8, 1 through 17. It's a wonderful parallel passage to life in the spirit and what that looks like. I want you to count how many times the Apostle Paul uses the word if in Romans 8, 1 through 17. It's a good test for our faith and our spirituality. So he says, who has bewitched you? Are you being so foolish? Are you trying to finish by means of the flesh? There's that word, flesh. The Greek word is sarx, S-A-R-X. 
And it's deeper than just skin and ligaments. It has a much deeper meaning. It refers to the sinful state of human beings. A power in opposition to the spirit. Direct opposition to the spirit. The Galatians weren't only confused, they were acting sinfully. They were acting in direct opposition to the spirit, adding things to God's word. John chapter 6 verse 33 says, The spirit gives life, the flesh counts for nothing. Before Jesus, the Jews had no hope of the Holy Spirit indwelling. Some of them did. David was given the Spirit, Moses. But it wasn't, he wasn't a common commodity available. So now here he comes, he dies, he rises again, and here this church is falling back into the old ways. He didn't come to require more works. You can work and work and work yourself to death and do everything to make yourself holy and righteous before God. It means nothing to him. Because Jesus paid the price. All you got to do is believe and change. (laughs) Verse 5. So again I ask, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law or by your believing what you heard? So also Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. All nations will be blessed through you. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. We got to stop there because this is some deep stuff. Tony's going to expand on it next week. He's given the message. Um, But this is some deep stuff. Abraham was God's first chosen. This is Old Testament stuff going way back. Why did God choose Abraham? It's God's choice. He was a man after God's own heart. So hang with me here. Interesting. Verse 8, Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. So we're talking about flesh versus spirit. Does the Holy Spirit indwell me? It's an important question. Why? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit is proof of salvation. Paul says, does God give you his spirit and work miracles among you by the works of the law? Miracles worked among the followers of Christ are from the Holy Spirit. Did God give you his spirit? Paul asks again. Um. Bear with me here, sorry. Did God give you his spirit? You know, if you follow Jesus faithfully for very long, you will, you'll see miracles and you'll hear of miracles. You might have even experienced a miracle. I have an eye t- a testimony that I share about my eyesight. Truly miraculous. Doctors said, I, would, I don't have binocular vision. When I go to 3D movies, I can't, I can't get it. Doctors thought I'd have double vision my whole life. I did for a short time until I was prayed for. <laughs> I can see. You know what? That's truly miraculous. But miracles are also more than we think. They're more than we think. How about a person that's freed from crippling anxiety and depression? How about a person that's freed from hatred and rage? Yelling so much their kids just run 
when they see him? How about a person that's just ruthless? Or lewd, foul-mouthed, being changed completely? God did all of those things in me too. All of them. There was a time I was so depressed and anxious, I just stayed in bed all day. Not anymore. I handed it over. I would rage. I was ruthless, so foul-mouthed. Just every other word, a cuss word. Something was missing. I was letting my flesh lead instead of the spirit lead. And that only comes through faith and connection to God through his Holy Spirit. So the Galatians experienced all of this like they were a solid church growing. Why change things? Why? We do it too. Why? Fear? Here these people come in and wow, they sound like they know a lot and they're saying, oh, we should go back to these old ways. Well, they worked for them before. Maybe, I don't know. <sighs> Why do we do that? We drop the standard of the Bible. Where is their faith? Faith is so important, and that's where Abraham comes in. Paul talked about um, we're children of Abraham. Uh, the promise God gave to Abraham, all nations will be blessed through you. What was Abraham's big faith deal? Anybody familiar with the story of Abraham and Isaac? If you're not, it's okay. Abraham was it. He was the chosen man, and everybody from his line would be the children of God. And he had one son, Isaac, and God said, God promised that through his offspring, there would be multitudes, more than the, than the sand on the seashore. And God says, well, I need you to take your son and take him up and... Uh, Sacrifice him. <laughs> okay. Abraham's faith is incredible. He knew God's promise that God would make him a nation. So he went and God did provide a sacrifice. There was He did not have to sacrifice his son. But his willingness to obey God in the face of everything was incredible faith. And that faith was credited to him as righteousness. So important. Our faith in Christ ties us and all Gentiles, non-Jews, to Abraham through our faith in Jesus. I know it's a little convoluted. But Paul is making such an important point. And what's, what's hilarious about all of this, the church in Galatia questioning Paul's authority and going back to uh, Jewish custom, Paul himself, before Jesus converted him, was the Jew of Jews. Like he, he was on his way to becoming a, a rabbi. Can you imagine his frustration? Like being converted from that and being an expert in that, and now here these people were coming in who weren't even Jews like he was a Jew, saying they should do this. It's crazy. That's why he's at wit's end. All nations will be blessed through Abraham. It says that many times in the Old Testament. Genesis 12, 3, Genesis 18, 18, Genesis 22, 18. As heirs of Abraham and his faith, our righteousness only comes through faith in Christ alone. His faith was credited to him as righteousness. Our faith in Christ is the same. 
You don't have to add anything to it. You don't have to do anything. Jesus' death and resurrection was enough. Verse 10. For all who rely on the works of the law are under a curse. As it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Clearly no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. The law is not based on faith. On the contrary, it says the person who does these things will live by them. So here Paul, he, and he's all through this, he is using quotes out of the Old Testament. Like he's not only arguing as an expert for Christ, but he's a bigger expert for the prosecution too than any of them are. Like he's, he's the authority. And he quotes Deuteronomy 27, 26. The Galatians here were relying on circumcision for justification. And the word says, if you want to rely on one part of the law to be justified, you got to do it all. You have to do it all. How many laws do you think there are in the first five books of the Old Testament? Anybody want to take a guess? 613 laws. There are other additions to that that count as laws too. First five books, 613 laws. 613 laws. Can you imagine? You got to keep them all. That's the problem with false doctrine and letting one little thing slip in. You got to stand on God's word. The Bible says that the law made us aware of what sin was. Abraham was before the law. So the law came and made us aware what sin was. He lived before the law, yet he was righteous. Why? Because his faith was credited to him as righteousness. It came back full circle through Christ. Sin is death. Sin equals death. And the law provided a boundary line between life and death. Christ became the bridge. Christ became it. He became the gate, the one way in. He also quotes uh, Habakkuk 2.4, an Old Testament prophet. It says, the righteous will live by faith. Faith in Jesus Christ rolls those laws, those 600 and some laws, into his death and resurrection. And now just three laws remain. Jesus was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. That's one. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's two. And the last thing he said before he ascended into heaven was go and make disciples of all nations, teaching and baptizing and training up in righteousness. Righteousness. God wants inward change, not outward actions. Inward change leads to outward actions that glorify God. Outward actions without inward change just glorify self. Oh, but he's a good person. He's a good person. None of us are good. Not one without Jesus Christ. The only good in me is Jesus Christ. Let's finish this up. Verse 13. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus. So that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Again, Paul goes to the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 21, 23. Cursed is everyone who is hung on a pole. Paul fought this tooth and nail. It may seem like a little thing. It's not.
Jesus took the curse of the law that exposed sin on himself to the cross. And his blood that was shed became the atonement that was needed as prescribed by the law. Atonement requires the blood of a perfect sacrifice, Hebrews 9.22. His death and resurrection obliterated sin and death on the accounts of those who have faith in him. Just like Abraham had complete faith. Jesus became the bridge for us, for the Gentiles, for the Jews, to be called children of God. 1 John chapter 3, verse 1 is one of my favorite verses. See what great love the Father has lavished on us, that we should be called children of God. And that is what we are. He gives us the promise of his spirit. Did you receive the spirit? It's mandatory to our faith. It's mandatory to not falling prey to false doctrine. The Holy Spirit is our counselor, our comforter, our teacher, our guide. He's an incredible source of power and of love and of self-control to stay connected to God. You see, God is spirit. It says that in the Bible. God is spirit and that we must worship him in spirit and in truth. John 4, 24. The Holy Spirit is God's spirit. God is spirit. He, the Holy Spirit, connects us with God. His indwelling connects us with God. That's the connection. That's why it's so important to have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you. How do you know? (laughs) It's coming up. Galatians 5, you want to get a head start? Galatians 5 and then again Romans 8, 1 through 17. Holy Spirit connects us with God. The Galatians were operating outside of the Spirit in their flesh, literally circumcision, operating in the flesh, in direct opposition to the Holy Spirit. They not only were just messing up a little, they were blatantly sinning against God. It was serious business. Romans 8, I said, I'll give you a little preview. It says, in Christ, the law of the Spirit, who gives life, sets free from the law of sin and death. We must live in the Spirit with minds set on what the Spirit desires or we are in opposition. And it's important to know. And I'll give you one word of proof of having The Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you, fruit. Fruit. Galatians 5, coming up. So if you're not sure if you received the Spirit, if you're not sure, you probably haven't. Honestly, you probably haven't. If you're not sure, and you can be like, oh, man, that's defeating. But it's a great opportunity. You're here. You have breath. You have desire. Maybe you're just not sure if you're living in step with the Spirit. Ding, ding. (laughs) Is your mind set on God's desires for your life? This is a great opportunity right now to hit the reset button. There's a prayer room right through that door on the right. When we pray, if you're not sure if you have the Holy Spirit indwelling, it's pretty important to know. If you've slidden back, you got out of step, there's people here to pray with you, to help you, to get plugged into you, to get you back in step. That's why we're here. That's why we do this. This is life and death. I take it that seriously. I hope you do too. So 
So with every head bowed, every eye closed, if today's your day, you can walk through that door. Heavenly Father, you are so good, and we love you so much. And in this world, it is so easy to operate in our flesh, in our own power, in our own understanding. Father, we just get in situations all the time where we don't know what to do, and we look and look, and sometimes we look everywhere but you. And um, Father, I pray your Holy Spirit would intercede in a powerful way. Um, Father, I pray if there's someone out there in the sound of my voice who's unsure if they have the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of them, um, I pray today would be their day. They reach out somehow. If it's online, they connect with me. Uh, they pray whatever. Lord, don't, don't let that um, opportunity go by. Help us to operate in the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us not to add anything to your word or take anything from your word, just to be true to it. We love you and praise you and ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.